Chapter 34 My Aunt Astonishes Me I wrote to Agnes as soon as Dora and I were engaged. I wrote her a long letter in which I tried to make her comprehend how blessed I was and what a darling Dora was. I entreated Agnes not to regard this as thoughtless passion which would ever yield to any other or had the least resemblance to the boyish fancies that we used to joke about. I assured her that its profundity was quite unfathomable and expressed my belief that nothing like it had ever been known. Somehow, as I wrote to Agnes on a fine evening by my open window, and the remembrance of her clear, calm eyes and gentle face came stealing over me, it shed such a beautiful influence upon the hurry and agitation in which I had been living lately, and of which my very happiness partook in some degree, that it soothed me into tears. I remember that I sat resting my head upon my hand when the letter was half done, cherishing a general fancy as if Agnes were one of the elements of my natural home, as if, in the retirement of the house made almost sacred to me by her presence, Dora and I must be happier than anywhere, as if, in love, joy, sorrow, hope, or disappointment, in all emotions, my heart turned naturally there, and found its refuge and best friend. Of Steerforth I said nothing. I only told her there had been sad grief at Yarmouth on account of Emily's flight, and that on me it made a double wound by reason of the circumstances attending it. I knew how quick she always was to divine the truth, and that she would never be the first to breathe his name. To this letter I received an answer by return of post. As I read it, I seemed to hear Agnes speaking to me. It was like her cordial voice in my ears. What can I say more? While I had been away from home lately, Traddles had called twice or thrice. Finding Peggotty within, and being informed by Peggotty, who always volunteered that information to whomsoever would receive it, that she was my old nurse, he had established a good-humoured acquaintance with her, and had stayed to have a little chat with her about me. So Peggotty said, but I am afraid that the chat was all on her own side, and of immoderate length, as she was very difficult indeed to stop, God bless her, when she had me for her theme. This reminds me, not only that I expected Traddles, on a certain afternoon of his own appointing, which was now come, but that Mrs. Crupp had resigned everything appertaining to her office, the salary accepted, until Peggotty should cease to present herself. Mrs. Crupp, after holding diverse conversations respecting Peggotty in a very high-pitched voice on the staircase, with some visible familiar, it would appear, for corporeally speaking she was quite alone at those times, addressed a letter to me, developing her views, beginning it with that statement of universal application which fitted every occurrence of her life, namely, that she was a mother herself. She went on to inform me that she had once seen very different days, but that at all periods of her existence she had had a constitutional objection to spies, intruders, and informers. She named no names. She said, let them, the cap fitted, wear it. But spies, intruders, and informers, especially in widow's weeds, this clause was underlined, she had ever accustomed herself to look down upon. If a gentleman was the victim of spies, intruders, and informers, but still naming no names, that was his own pleasure. He had a right to please himself, so let him do. All that she, Mrs. Crupp, stipulated for was that she should not be brought in contract with such persons. Therefore she begged to be excused from any further attendance on the top set, until things were as they formerly was, and as they could be wished to be, and further mentioned that her little book would be found upon the breakfast table every Saturday morning when she requested an immediate settlement of the same, with a benevolent view of saving trouble, and an ill convenience to all parties. After this, Mrs. Crupp confined herself to making pitfalls on the stairs, principally with pitchers and endeavouring to delude Peggotty into breaking her legs. I found it rather harassing to live in this state of siege, but was too much afraid of Mrs. Crupp to see any way out of it. "'My dear Copperfield!' cried Traddles, punctually appearing at my door, in spite of all these obstacles. "'How do you do?' "'My dear Traddles,' said I, I am delighted to see you at last, 
and very sorry I have not been at home before, but I have been so much engaged. Yes, yes, I know, said Traddles. Of course. Yours lives in London, I think. What did you say? She, excuse me, Miss D, you know, said Traddles, colouring in his great delicacy, lives in London, I believe. Uh, oh, yes, near London. Mine, perhaps you recollect, said Traddles, with a serious look, lives down in Devonshire, one of ten. Consequently, I'm not so much engaged as you in, in that sense. I wonder you can bear, I returned, to see her so seldom. Ah, said Traddles thoughtfully, it does seem a wonder, I suppose it is, Copperfield, because there's no help for it. I suppose so, I replied with a smile, and not without a blush, and because you have so much constancy and patience, Traddles. Dear me, said Traddles, considering about it, do I strike you in that way, Copperfield? Really, I don't know that I had, but she is such an extraordinary dear girl herself that it's possible she may have imparted something of those virtues to me. Now you mention it, Copperfield, I shouldn't wonder at all. I assure you she is always forgetting herself and taking care of the other nine. Is she the eldest? I inquired. Oh, dear, no, said Traddles. The eldest is a beauty. He saw, I suppose, that I could not help smiling at the simplicity of this reply, and added with a smile upon his own ingenuous face. Not of course, but that my Sophie, pretty name, Copperfield, I always think. Very pretty, said I. Not of course, but that Sophie is beautiful too in my eyes, and would be one of the dearest girls that ever was in anybody's eyes, I should think. But when I say the eldest is a beauty, I mean she really is a... He seemed to be describing clouds about himself with both hands. Splendid, you know, said Traddles energetically. Indeed, said I. Oh, I assure you, said Traddles, something very uncommon indeed. Then, you know, being formed for society and admiration and not being able to enjoy much of it in consequence of their limited means, she naturally gets a little irritable and exacting sometimes. Sophie puts her in a good humour. Is Sophie the youngest? I hazarded. Oh, dear, no, said Traddles, stroking his chin. The two youngest are only nine and ten. Sophie educates them. The second daughter, perhaps? I hazarded. No, said Traddles. Sarah's the second. Sarah has something the matter with her spine, poor girl. The malady will wear out by and by, the doctors say, but in the meantime she has to lie down for a twelve-month. Sophie nurses her. Sophie's the fourth. Is the mother living? I inquired. Oh, yes, said Traddles. She is alive. She is a very superior woman indeed, but the damp country is not adapted to her constitution, and, in fact, she has lost the use of her limbs. Dear me, said I. Very sad, is it not? returned Traddles. But in a merely domestic view, it is not so bad as it might be, because Sophie takes her place. She is quite as much a mother to her mother as she is to the other nine. I felt the greatest admiration for the virtues of this young lady, and honestly, with the view of doing my best to prevent the good nature of Traddles from being imposed upon to the detriment of their joint prospects in life, inquired how Mr. Micawber was. "'He is quite well, Copperfield, thank you,' said Traddles. "'I am not living with him at present.' "'No?' "'No. You see, the truth is,' said Traddles in a whisper, "'he's changed his name to Mortimer in consequence of his temporary embarrassments, and he don't come out till after dark, and then in spectacles. There was an execution put into our house for rent. Mrs. Micawber was in such a dreadful state that I really couldn't resist giving my name to that second bill we spoke of here. You may imagine how delightful it was to my feelings, Copperfield, to see the matter settled with it, and Mrs. Micawber recover her spirits. Hmm, said I. Not that her happiness was of long duration, pursued Traddles, for unfortunately, within a week another execution came in. It broke up the establishment. I've been living in a furnished apartment since then, and the Mortimers have been very private indeed. I hope you won't think it selfish, Copperfield, if I mention that the broker carried off my little round table with the marble top, 
and Sophie's flower-pot, and stand. "'What a hard thing!' I exclaimed indignantly. "'It was a—it was a pull,' said Traddles, with his usual wince at that expression. "'I don't mention it reproachfully, however, but with a motive. The fact is, Copperfield, I was unable to repurchase them at the time of their seizure. In the first place, because the broker, having an idea that I wanted them, ran the price up to an extravagant extent, and in the second place, because I hadn't any money. Now I have kept my eye since upon the broker's shop, said Traddles, with a great enjoyment of his mystery, which is up at the top of Tottenham Court Road, and at last today I find them put up for sale. I have only noticed them from over the way, because if the broker saw me, bless you, he'd ask any price for them. What has occurred to me, having now the money, is that perhaps you wouldn't object to ask that good nurse of yours to come with me to the shop, I can show it to her from round the corner of the next street, and make the best bargain for them, as if they were for herself, that she can. The delight with which Traddles propounded this plan to me, and the sense he had of its uncommon artfulness, are among the freshest things in my remembrance. I told him that my old nurse would be delighted to assist him, and that we would all three take the field together, but on one condition. That condition was that he should make a solemn resolution to grant no more loans of his name or anything else to Mr. Micawber. "'My dear Copperfield,' said Traddles, "'I have already done so, because I begin to feel that I have not only been inconsiderate, but that I have been positively unjust to Sophie.' My word being passed to myself, there is no longer any apprehension, but I pledge it to you too with the greatest readiness. The first unlucky obligation I have paid. I have no doubt Mr. Micawber would have paid it if he could, but he could not. One thing I ought to mention, which I like very much in Mr. Micawber, Copperfield, it refers to the second obligation, which is not yet due. He don't tell me that it is provided for, but he says it will be. Now, I think there is something very fair and honest about that." I was unwilling to damp my good friend's confidence, and therefore assented. After a little further conversation we went round to the chandler's shop to enlist Peggotty. Traddles, declining to pass the evening with me, both because he endured the liveliest apprehensions that his property would be bought by somebody else before he could repurchase it, and because it was the evening he always devoted to writing to the dearest girl in the world. I never shall forget him peeping around the corner of the street in Tottenham Court Road while Peggotty was bargaining for the precious articles, or his agitation when she came slowly towards us after vainly offering a price and was hailed by the relenting broker and went back again. The end of the negotiation was that she bought the property on tolerably easy terms and Traddles was transported with pleasure. "'I am very much obliged to you indeed,' said Traddles, on hearing it was to be sent to where he lived that night. "'If I might ask one other favour, I hope you would not think it absurd, Copperfield.' I said beforehand, certainly not. "'Then if you would be good enough,' said Traddles to Peggotty, "'to get the flower-pot now, I think I should like, it being Sophie's Copperfield, to carry it home myself.' Peggotty was glad to get it for him, and he overwhelmed her with thanks, and went his way up Tottenham Court Road, carrying the flower-pot affectionately in his arms, with one of the most delighted expressions of countenance I ever saw. We then turned back towards my chambers. As the shops had charms for Peggotty which I never knew them possess in the same degree for anybody else, I sauntered easily along, amused by her staring in at the windows and waiting for her as often as she chose. We were thus a good while in getting to the Adelphi. On our way upstairs I called her attention to the sudden disappearance of Mrs. Crupp's pitfalls, and also to the prints of recent footsteps. We were both very much surprised, coming higher up, to find my outer door standing open, which I had shut, and to hear voices inside. We looked at one another without knowing what to make of this, and went into the sitting-room. What was my amazement to find, of all people upon earth, my aunt there, and Mr. Dick! 
my aunt sitting on a quantity of luggage with her two birds before her and her cat on her knee like a female Robinson Crusoe drinking tea, Mr. Dick leaning thoughtfully on a great kite, such as we had often been out together to fly, with more luggage piled about him. "'My dear aunt!' cried I. "'Why, what an unexpected pleasure!' We cordially embraced, and Mr. Dick and I cordially shook hands, and Mrs. Crupp, who was busy making tea, and could not be too attentive, cordially said she had knowed well as Mr. Copperfield would have his heart in his mouth when he see his dear relations. Hallo, said my aunt Peggotty, who quailed before her awful presence. "'How are you?' "'You remember my aunt, Peggotty,' said I. "'For the love of goodness, child!' exclaimed my aunt. "'Don't call the woman by that South Sea Island name. "'If she married and got rid of it, which was the best thing she could do, "'why don't you give me the benefit of the change?' "'What's your name now, P?' said my aunt, as a compromise for the obnoxious appellation. "'Barkis, ma'am,' said Peggotty, with a curtsy. "'Well, that's human,' said my aunt. "'It sounds less as if you wanted a missionary. "'How do you do, Barkis? I hope you're well.' Encouraged by these gracious words, and by my aunt's extending her hand, Barkis came forward and took the hand and curtsied her acknowledgments. "'We are older than we were, I see,' said my aunt. "'We have only met each other once before, you know. "'A nice business we made of it then. "'Trot, my dear, another cup.' I handed it dutifully to my aunt, who was in her usual inflexible state of figure, and ventured a remonstrance with her on the subject of her sitting on a box. "'Let me draw the sofa here, or the easy-chair, aunt,' said I. "'Why should you be so uncomfortable?' "'Thank you, Trot,' replied my aunt. "'I prefer to sit upon my property.' Here my aunt looked hard at Mrs. Crupp and observed, "'We needn't trouble you to wait, ma'am.' "'Shall I put a little more tea in the pot afore I go, ma'am?' said Mrs. Crupp. "'No, I thank you, ma'am,' replied my aunt. "'Would you let me fetch another pat of butter, ma'am?' said Mrs. Crupp. "'Or would you be persuaded to try a new laid hag? "'Or should I brile a rasher?' "'Ain't there nothing I could do for your dear aunt, Mr. Copperful?' "'Nothing, ma'am,' returned my aunt. "'I shall do very well, I thank you.' Mrs. Crupp, who had been incessantly smiling to express sweet temper, and incessantly holding her head on one side to express a general feebleness of constitution, and incessantly rubbing her hands to express a desire to be of service to all deserving objects, gradually smiled herself, one-sided herself, and rubbed herself out of the room. "'Dick,' said my aunt, "'you know what I told you about time-servers and wealth-worshippers?' Mr. Dick, with rather a scared look, as if he had forgotten it, returned a hasty answer in the affirmative. "'Mrs. Crupp is one of them,' said my aunt. "'Barkis, I'll trouble you to look after the tea and let me have another cup, for I don't fancy that woman's pouring out.' I knew my aunt sufficiently well to know that she had something of importance on her mind, and that there was far more matter in this arrival than a stranger might have supposed. I noticed how her eye lighted on me when she thought my attention otherwise occupied, and what a curious process of hesitation appeared to be going on within her, while she preserved her outward stiffness and composure. I began to reflect whether I had done anything to offend her, and my conscience whispered me that I had not yet told her about Dora. Could it be any means by that, I wondered? As I knew she would only speak in her own good time, I sat down near her, and spoke to the birds, and played with the cat, and was as easy as I could be. But I was very far from being really easy, and I should still have been so, even if Mr. Dick, leaning over the great kite behind my aunt, had not taken every secret opportunity of shaking his head darkly at me and pointing at her. "'Trot,' said my aunt at last, when she had finished her tea and carefully smoothed down her dress and wiped her lips, "'you needn't go, Barkis. "'Trot, have you got to be firm and self-reliant?' "'I hope so, aunt.' "'What do you think?' inquired Miss Betsy. "'I think so, aunt.' "'Then why, my love?' said my aunt, looking earnestly at me. 
Why do you think I prefer to sit upon this property of mine to-night? I shook my head, unable to guess. Because, said my aunt, it's all I have. Because I'm ruined, my dear. If the house and every one of us had tumbled out into the river together, I could hardly have received a greater shock. Dick knows it, said my aunt, laying her hand calmly on my shoulder. I am ruined, my dear Trot. All I have in the world is in this room, except the cottage, and that I have left Janet to let. Barkis, I want to get a bed for this gentleman to-night. To save expense, perhaps you could make up something here for myself. Anything will do. It's only for to-night. We'll talk about this more to-morrow. I was roused from my amazement and concern for her, I am sure for her, by her falling on my neck for a moment and crying that she only grieved for me. In another moment she suppressed this emotion, and said with an aspect more triumphant than dejected, "'We must meet reverse boldly, and not suffer them to frighten us, my dear. We must learn to act the play out. We must live misfortune down, Trot.' Chapter 35 Depression As soon as I could recover my presence of mind, which quite deserted me in the first overpowering shock of my aunt's intelligence, I proposed to Mr. Dick to come round to the chandler's shop and take possession of the bed which Mr. Peggotty had lately vacated. The chandler's shop being in Hungerford Market, and Hungerford Market being a very different place in those days, there was a low wooden colonnade before the door, not very unlike that before the house where the little man and woman used to live in the old weather glass, which pleased Mr. Dick mightily. The glory of lodging over this structure would have compensated him, I dare say, for many inconveniences, but as there were really few to bear beyond the compound of flavours I have already mentioned, and perhaps the want of a little more elbow-room, he was perfectly charmed with his accommodation. Mrs. Crupp had indignantly assured him that there wasn't room to swing a cat there, but, as Mr. Dick justly observed to me, sitting down on the foot of the bed nursing his leg, "'You know, Trotwood, I don't want to swing a cat. I never do swing a cat. Therefore, what does that signify to me? I tried to ascertain whether Mr. Dick had any understanding of the causes of this sudden and great change in my aunt's affairs. As I might have expected, he had none at all. The only account he could give of it was that my aunt had said to him the day before yesterday, "'Now, Dick, are you really and truly the philosopher I take you for?' That then he had said, "'Yes, he hoped so,' that then my aunt had said, "'Dick, I am ruined,' that then he had said, "'Oh, indeed,' that then my aunt had praised him highly, which he was very glad of, and that then they had come to me and had had bottled porter and sandwiches on the road. Mr. Dick was so very complacent, sitting on the foot of the bed, nursing his leg, and telling me this with his eyes wide open and a surprised smile, that I am sorry to say I was provoked into explaining to him that ruin meant distress, want, and starvation. But I was soon bitterly reproved for this harshness by seeing his face turn pale and tears course down his lengthened cheeks, while he fixed upon me a look of such unutterable woe that it might have softened a far harder heart than mine. I took infinitely greater pains to cheer him up again than I had taken to depress him, and I soon understood, as I ought to have known at first, that he had been so confident, merely because of his faith in the wisest and most wonderful of women, and his unbounded reliance on my intellectual resources. The latter, I believe, he considered a match for any kind of disaster not absolutely mortal. "'What can we do, Trotwood?' said Mr. Dick. "'There's the memorial.' "'To be sure there is,' said I. "'But all we can do just now, Mr. Dick, is to keep a cheerful countenance and not let my aunt see that we are thinking about it.' He assented to this in the most earnest manner, and implored me if I should see him wandering an inch out of the right course to recall him by some of those superior methods which were always at my command. But I regret to state 
that the fright I had given him proved too much for his best attempts at concealment. All the evening his eyes wandered to my aunt's face with an expression of the most dismal apprehension, as if he saw her growing thin on the spot. He was conscious of this, and put a constraint upon his head, but his keeping that immovable and sitting rolling his eyes like a piece of machinery did not mend the matter at all. I saw him look at the loaf at supper, which happened to be a small one, as if nothing else stood between us and famine. And when my aunt insisted on his making his customary repast, I detected him in the act of pocketing fragments of his bread and cheese, I have no doubt for the purpose of reviving us with those savings when we should have reached an advanced stage of attenuation. My aunt, on the other hand, was in a composed frame of mind, which was a lesson to all of us, to me, I am sure. She was extremely gracious to Peggotty, except when I inadvertently called her by that name, and, strange as I knew she felt in London, appeared quite at home. She was to have my bed, and I was to lie in the sitting-room, to keep guard over her. She made a great point of being so near the river, in case of a conflagration, and I suppose really did find some satisfaction in that circumstance. "'Trot, my dear,' said my aunt, when she saw me making preparations for compounding her usual night draught. "'No.' "'Nothing, aunt?' "'Not wine, my dear. Ale.' "'But there is wine here, aunt, and you always have it made of wine.' "'Keep that in case of sickness,' said my aunt. "'We mustn't use it carelessly, Trot. Ale for me, half a pint.' I thought Mr. Dick would have fallen insensible. My aunt being resolute, I went out and got the ale myself. As it was growing late, Peggotty and Mr. Dick took that opportunity of repairing to the Chandler's shop together. I parted from him, poor fellow, at the corner of the street, with his great kite at his back, a very monument of human misery. My aunt was walking up and down the room when I returned, crimping the borders of her nightcap with her fingers. I warmed the ale and made the toast on the usual infallible principles. When it was ready for her, she was ready for it, with her nightcap on and the skirt of her gown turned back on her knees. "'My dear,' said my aunt, after taking a spoonful of it, "'it's a great deal better than wine, not half so bilious.' I suppose I looked doubtful, for she added, "'Tut, tut, child! If nothing worse than ale happens to us, we are well off.' "'I should think so myself, aunt, I'm sure,' said I. "'Well, then, why don't you think so?' said my aunt. "'Because you and I are very different people,' I returned. "'Stuff and nonsense, Trot,' replied my aunt. My aunt went on with a quiet enjoyment in which there was very little affectation, if any, drinking the warm ale with a teaspoon and soaking her strips of toast in it. "'Trot,' said she, "'I don't care for strange faces in general, but I rather like that Barkis of yours, do you know?' "'It's better than a hundred pounds to hear you say so,' said I. "'It's a most extraordinary world,' observed my aunt, rubbing her nose. "'How that woman ever got into it with that name is unaccountable to me. It would be much more easy to be born a Jackson or something of that sort, one would think.' "'Perhaps she thinks so, too. It's not her fault,' said I. "'I suppose not,' returned my aunt, rather grudging the admission. "'But it's very aggravating. "'However, she's Barkis now. "'That's some comfort. "'Barkis is uncommonly fond of you, Trot.' "'There's nothing she would leave undone to prove it,' said I. "'Nothing, I believe,' returned my aunt. "'Here, the poor fool has been begging and praying "'about handing over some of her money "'because she has got too much of it. "'A simpleton!' "'My aunt's tears of pleasure were positively trickling down "'into the warm ale.' "'She's the most ridiculous creature that ever was born,' said my aunt. "'I knew from the first moment when I saw her with that poor dear blessed baby of a mother of yours that she was the most ridiculous of mortals. But there are good points in Barkis.' Affecting to laugh, she got an opportunity of putting her hand to her eyes. Having availed herself of it, she resumed her toast and her discourse together. "'Oh, mercy upon us!' sighed my aunt. 
I know all about it, Trot. Barkis and myself had quite a gossip while you were out with Dick. I know all about it. I don't know where these wretched girls expect to go to, for my part. I wonder they don't knock out their brains against against mantelpieces, said my aunt, an idea which was probably suggested to her by her contemplation of mine. Poor Emily, said I. Oh, don't talk to me about poor, returned my aunt. She should have thought of that before she caused so much misery. Give me a kiss, Trot. I am sorry for your early experience. As I bent forward, she put her tumble on my knee to detain me, and said, Oh, Trot, Trot, and so you fancy yourself in love, do you? Fancy, aunt, I exclaimed, as red as I could be. I adore her with my whole soul. Dora, indeed, returned my aunt. And you mean to say the little thing is very fascinating, I suppose? My dear aunt, I replied, no one can form the least idea of what she is. Ah, and not silly, said my aunt. Silly, aunt? I seriously believe it had never once entered my head for a single moment to consider what she was or not. I resented the idea, of course, but I was in a manner struck by it, as a new one altogether. "'Not light-headed,' said my aunt. "'Light-headed, aunt?' I could only repeat this daring speculation with the same kind of feeling with which I had repeated the preceding question. "'Well, well,' said my aunt. "'I only ask. I don't depreciate her. Poor little couple. And so you think you were formed for one another, and are to go through a party-supper-table kind of life, like two pretty pieces of confectionery, do you, Trot?' She asked me this so kindly, and with such a gentle air, half playful and half sorrowful, that I was quite touched. "'We are young and inexperienced, aunt, I know,' I replied. "'And I dare say we say and think a good deal that is rather foolish. But we love one another truly, I am sure. If I thought Dora could ever love anybody else, or cease to love me, or that I could ever love anybody else, or cease to love her, I don't know what I should do. Go out of my mind, I think." "'Ah, Trot!' said my aunt, shaking her head and smiling gravely. "'Blind! Blind! Blind!' "'Someone that I know, Trot,' my aunt pursued, after a pause, "'though of a very pliant disposition, has an earnestness of affection in him that reminds me of poor baby. Earnestness is what that somebody must look for to sustain him and improve him, Trot. Deep, downright, faithful earnestness. "'If you only knew the earnestness of Dora, aunt,' I cried. "'Oh, Trot,' she said again, "'blind, blind!' And without knowing why, I felt a vague, unhappy loss, or want of something, overshadow me like a cloud. "'However,' said my aunt, I don't want to put two young creatures out of conceit with themselves, or to make them unhappy, so, though it is a girl and boy attachment, and girl and boy attachments very often, mind, I don't say always, come to nothing. Still, we'll be serious about it, and hope for a prosperous issue one of these days. There's time enough for it to come to anything." This was not upon the whole very comforting to a rapturous lover. But I was glad to have my aunt in my confidence, and I was mindful of her being fatigued. So I thanked her ardently for this mark of her affection, and for all her other kindnesses towards me, and after a tender good night she took her nightcap into my bedroom. How miserable I was when I lay down! How I thought and thought about my being poor in Mr. Spenlow's eyes! about my not being what I thought I was when I proposed to Dora, about the chivalrous necessity of telling Dora what my worldly condition was, and releasing her from her engagement if she thought fit, about how I should contrive to live during the long term of my articles when I was earning nothing, about doing something to assist my aunt, and seeing no way of doing anything, about coming down to have no money in my pocket and to wear a shabby coat, and to be able to carry Dora no little presents, and to ride no gallant greys, and to show myself in no agreeable light. Sordid and selfish as I knew it was, 
and as I tortured myself by knowing that it was to let my mind run on my own distress so much, I was so devoted to Dora that I could not help it. I knew that it was base in me not to think more of my aunt and less of myself, but so far selfishness was inseparable from Dora, and I could not put Dora on one side for any mortal creature. How exceedingly miserable I was that night! As to sleep, I had dreams of poverty in all sorts of shapes, but I seemed to dream without the previous ceremony of going to sleep. Now I was ragged, wanting to sell Dora matches, six bundles for half a penny. Now I was at the office in a nightgown and boots, remonstrated with by Mr. Spenlow on appearing before the clients in that airy attire. Now I was hungrily picking up the crumbs that fell from old Tiffy's daily biscuit, regularly eaten when St. Paul's struck one. Now I was hopelessly endeavouring to get a licence to marry Dora, having nothing but one of Uriah Heep's gloves to offer in exchange, which the whole commons rejected, and still, more or less conscious of my own room, I was always tossing about like a distressed ship in a sea of bedclothes. My aunt was restless too, for I frequently heard her walking to and fro. Two or three times in the course of the night, attired in a long flannel wrapper in which she looked seven feet high, she appeared like a disturbed ghost in my room, and came to the side of the sofa on which I lay. On the first occasion I started up in alarm, to learn that she inferred from a particular light in the sky that Westminster Abbey was on fire, and to be consulted in reference to the probability of its igniting Buckingham Street in case the wind changed. Lying still after that, I found that she sat down near me whispering to herself, "'Poor boy!' and then it made me twenty times more wretched to know how unselfishly mindful she was of me, and how selfishly mindful I was of myself. It was difficult to believe that a night so long to me could be short to anybody else. This consideration set me thinking and thinking of an imaginary party where people were dancing the hours away until that became a dream too, and I heard the music incessantly playing one tune and saw Dora incessantly dancing one dance, without taking the least notice of me. The man who had been playing the harp all night was trying in vain to cover it with an ordinary-sized nightcap when I awoke, or, I should rather say, when I left off trying to go to sleep, and saw the sun shining in through the window at last. There was an old Roman bath in those days at the bottom of one of the streets out of the Strand. It may be there still in which I have had many a cold plunge. Dressing myself as quietly as I could, and leaving Peggotty to look after my aunt, I tumbled head foremost into it, and then went for a walk to Hampstead. I had a hope that this brisk treatment might freshen my wits a little, and I think it did them good, for I soon came to the conclusion that the first step I ought to take was to try if my articles could be cancelled and the premium recovered. I got some breakfast on the heath, and walked back to Doctor's Commons along the watered roads, and through a pleasant smell of summer flowers growing in gardens, and carried into town on huckster's heads, intent on this first effort to meet our altered circumstances. I arrived at the office so soon after all, that I had half an hour's loitering about the Commons, before old Tiffy, who was always first, appeared with his key. Then I sat down in my shady corner, looking up at the sunlight on the opposite chimney-pots, and thinking about Dora, until Mr. Spenlow came in, crisp and curly. "'How are you, Copperfield?' said he. "'Fine morning.' "'Beautiful morning, sir,' said I. "'Could I say a word to you before you go into court?' "'By all means,' said he. "'Come into my room.' I followed him into his room, and he began putting on his gown and touching himself up before a little glass he had hanging inside a closet door. "'I am sorry to say,' said I, "'that I have some rather disheartening intelligence from my aunt.' "'No,' said he. "'Dear me! Not paralysis, I hope.' "'It has no reference to her health, sir,' I replied. "'She has met with some large losses. In fact, she has very little left indeed.' "'You astound me, Copperfield!' cried Mr. Spenlow. I shook my head. 
"'Indeed, sir,' said I. "'Her affairs are so changed that I wish to ask you whether it would be possible, at a sacrifice on our part of some portion of the premium, of course, I put in this, on the spur of the moment, warned by the blank expression on his face, to cancel my articles. What it cost me to make this proposal nobody knows. It was like asking as a favour to be sentenced to transportation from Dora. To cancel your articles, Copperfield? Cancel? I explained, with tolerable firmness, that I really did not know where my means of subsistence were to come from, unless I could earn them for myself. I had no fear for the future, I said, and I laid great emphasis on that, as if to imply that I should still be decidedly eligible for a son-in-law one of these days, but for the present I was thrown upon my own resources. "'I am extremely sorry to hear this, Copperfield,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'Extremely sorry. It is not usual to cancel articles for any such reason. It is not a professional course of proceeding. It is not a convenient precedent at all. Far from it. At the same time—' "'You're very good, sir,' I murmured, anticipating a concession. "'Not at all. Don't mention it,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'At the same time I was going to say, if it had been my lot to have my hands unfettered, if I had not a partner, Mr. Jorkins, my hopes were dashed in a moment. But I made another effort. "'Do you think, sir,' said I, "'if I were to mention it to Mr. Jorkins?' Mr. Spenlow shook his head discouragingly. "'Heaven forbid, Copperfield,' he replied, "'that I should do any man an injustice, still less Mr. Jorkins. But I know my partner, Copperfield. Mr. Jorkins is not a man to respond to a proposition of this peculiar nature. Mr. Jorkins is very difficult to move from the beaten track. You know what he is.' "'I'm sure I knew nothing about him.' except that he had originally been alone in the business, and now lived by himself in a house near Montague Square, which was fearfully in want of painting, that he came very late of a day, and went away very early, that he never appeared to be consulted about anything, and that he had a dingy little black hole of his own upstairs, where no business was ever done, and where there was a yellow old cartridge paper pad upon his desk, unsoiled by ink, and reported to be twenty years of age. "'Would you object to me mentioning to him, sir?' I asked. "'By no means,' said Mr. Spenlow. "'But I have some experience of Mr. Jorkins, Copperfield. I wish it were otherwise, for I should be happy to meet your views in any respect. I cannot have the least objection to your mentioning to Mr. Jorkins, Copperfield, if you think it worth while.' Availing myself of this permission, which was given with a warm shake of the hand, I sat thinking about Dora, and looking at the sunlight stealing from the chimney-pots down the wall of the opposite house, until Mr. Jorkins came. I then went up to Mr. Jorkins' room, and evidently astonished Mr. Jorkins very much by making my appearance there. "'Come in, Mr. Copperfield,' said Mr. Jorkins. "'Come in.' I went in and sat down, and stated my case to Mr. Jorkins, pretty much as I had stated it to Mr. Spenlow. Mr. Jorkins was not by any means the awful creature one might have expected, but a large, mild, smooth-faced man of sixty, who took so much snuff that there was a tradition in the Commons that he lived principally on that stimulant, having little room in his system for any other article of diet. "'You have mentioned this to Mr. Spenlow, I suppose?' said Mr. Jorkins, when he had heard me, very restlessly, to an end. I answered yes, and told him that Mr. Spenlow had introduced his name. "'He said I should object,' asked Mr. Jorkins. I was obliged to admit that Mr. Spenlow had considered it probable. "'I am sorry to say, Mr. Copperfield, I can't advance your object,' said Mr. Jorkins nervously. "'The fact is, but I have an appointment at the bank, if you'll have the goodness to excuse me.' With that he rose in a great hurry and was going out of the room when I made bold to say that I feared then there was no way of arranging the matter. "'No,' said Mr. Jorkins, stopping at the door to shake his head. "'Oh, no! I object, you know!' which he said very rapidly and went out. 
"'You must be aware, Mr. Copperfield,' he added, looking restlessly in at the door again, "'if Mr. Spenlow objects.' "'Personally, he does not object, sir,' said I. "'Oh, personally,' repeated Mr. Jorkins, in an impatient manner. "'I assure you there's an objection, Mr. Copperfield. "'Hopeless! What you wish to be done can't be done. "'I—I I really have got an appointment at the bank.' With that he fairly ran away, and to the best of my knowledge it was three days before he showed himself in the Commons again. Being very anxious to leave no stone unturned, I waited until Mr. Spenlow came in, and then described what had passed, giving him to understand that I was not hopeless of his being able to soften the adamantine Jorkins if he would undertake the task. Copperfield, returned Mr. Spenlow with a gracious smile, you have not known my partner, Mr. Jorkins, as long as I have. Nothing is farther from my thoughts than to attribute any degree of artifice to Mr. Jorkins. But Mr. Jorkins has a way of stating his objections which often deceives people. No, Copperfield, shaking his head, Mr. Jorkins is not to be moved, believe me. I was completely bewildered between Mr. Spenlow and Mr. Jorkins as to which of them really was the objecting partner. But I saw with sufficient clearness that there was obduracy somewhere in the firm, and that the recovery of my aunt's thousand pounds was out of the question. In a state of despondency, which I remember with anything but satisfaction, for I know it still had too much reference to myself, though always in connection with Dora, I left the office and went homeward. I was trying to familiarise my mind with the worst, and to present to myself the arrangements we should have to make for the future in their sternest aspect, when a hackney chariot, coming after me and stopping at my very feet, occasioned me to look up. A fair hand was stretched forth to me from the window, and the face I had never seen without a feeling of serenity and happiness from the moment when it first turned back on the old oak staircase with the great broad balustrade and when I associated its softened beauty with the stained-glass window in the church, was smiling on me. "'Agnes!' I joyfully exclaimed. "'Oh, my dear Agnes! Of all people in the world, what a pleasure to see you!' "'Is it indeed?' she said in her cordial voice. "'I want to talk to you so much,' said I. "'It's such a lightening of my heart, only to look at you. If I had had a conjurer's cap, there is no one I should have wished for but you.' "'What?' returned Agnes. "'Well, perhaps Dora first. I admitted with a blush. "'Certainly Dora first, I hope,' said Agnes, laughing. "'But you next,' said I. "'Where are you going?' "'She was going to my rooms to see my aunt. "'The day being very fine, she was glad to come out of the chariot, "'which smelt, I had my head in it all this time, "'like a stable put under a cucumber frame.' I dismissed the coachman, and she took my arm, and we walked on together. She was like hope embodied to me. How different I felt in one short minute, having Agnes at my side. My aunt had written her one of the odd, abrupt notes, very little longer than a banknote, to which her epistolary efforts were usually limited. She had stated therein that she had fallen into adversity, and was leaving Dover for good, but had quite made up her mind to it, and was so well that nobody need be uncomfortable about her. Agnes had come to London to see my aunt, between whom and herself there had been a mutual liking these many years. Indeed, it dated from the time of my taking up my residence in Mr. Wickfield's house. She was not alone, she said. Her papa was with her. And Uriah Heep. And now they are partners, said I confound him. Yes, said Agnes. They have some business here, and I took advantage of their coming to come too. You must not think my visit all friendly and disinterested, Trotwood, for, I am afraid, I may be cruelly prejudiced. I do not like to let Papa go away alone with him. Does he exercise the same influence over Mr. Wickfield still, Agnes? Agnes shook her head. There is such a change at home, she said, that you would scarcely know the dear old house. They live with us now. They? said I. Mr. Heap and his mother. 
"'He sleeps in your old room,' said Agnes, looking up into my face. "'I wish I had the ordering of his dreams,' said I. "'He wouldn't sleep there long.' "'I keep my own little room,' said Agnes, "'where I used to learn my lessons. "'How the time goes. "'You remember? "'The little panelled room that opens from the drawing-room.' "'Remember, Agnes? "'When I saw you for the first time, "'coming out at the door with your quaint little basket of keys "'hanging at your side?' "'It is just the same,' said Agnes, smiling. "'I am glad you think of it so pleasantly. "'We were very happy.' "'We were indeed,' said I. "'I keep that room to myself still, "'but I cannot always desert Mrs. Heap, you know. "'And so,' said Agnes quietly, "'I feel obliged to bear her company "'when I might prefer to be alone. "'But I have no other reason to complain of her. "'If she tires me sometimes by her praises of her son, "'It is only natural in a mother. "'He is a very good son to her.' "'I looked at Agnes when she said these words "'without detecting in her any consciousness of Uriah's design. "'Her mild but earnest eyes met mine with her own beautiful frankness, "'and there was no change in her gentle face. "'The chief evil of their presence in the house,' said Agnes, "'is that I cannot be as near Papa as I could wish. "'Uriah Heap being so much between us, and cannot watch over him, if that is not too bold a thing to say, as closely as I would. But if any fraud or treachery is practising against him, I hope that simple love and truth will be stronger in the end. I hope that real love and truth are stronger in the end than any evil or misfortune in the world. A certain bright smile, which I never saw on any other face, died away, even while I thought how good it was, and how familiar it had once been to me. And she asked me with a quick change of expression, we were drawing very near my street, if I knew how the reverse in my aunt's circumstances had been brought about. On my replying no, she had not told me yet, Agnes became thoughtful, and I fancied I felt her arm tremble in mine. We found my aunt alone, in a state of some excitement. A difference of opinion had arisen between herself and Mrs. Crupp on an abstract question, the propriety of chambers being inhabited by the gentler sex, and my aunt, utterly indifferent to spasms on the part of Mrs. Crupp, had cut the dispute short by informing that lady that she smelt of my brandy and that she would trouble her to walk out. Both of these expressions Mrs. Crupp considered actionable, and had expressed her intention of bringing before a British Judy meaning, it was supposed, the bulwark of our national liberties. My aunt, however, having had time to cool while Peggotty was out showing Mr. Dick the soldiers at the house-guards, and being, besides, greatly pleased to see Agnes, rather plumed herself on the affair than otherwise, and received us with unimpaired good humour. When Agnes laid her bonnet on the table, and sat down beside her, I could not but think, looking on her mild eyes and her radiant forehead, how natural it seemed to have her there, how trustfully, although she was so young and inexperienced, my aunt confided in her, how strong she was indeed, in simple love and truth. We began to talk about my aunt's losses, and I told them what I had tried to do that morning. "'Which was injudicious, Trot,' said my aunt, "'but well meant.' "'You are a generous boy, I suppose I must say, young man now, "'and I am proud of you, my dear. "'So far, so good. "'Now, Trot and Agnes, let us look the case of Betsy Trotwood in the face "'and see how it stands.' "'I observed Agnes turn pale as she looked very attentively at my aunt. "'My aunt, patting her cat, looked very attentively at Agnes. "'Betsy Trotwood,' said my aunt, who had always kept her money matters to herself. "'I don't mean your sister, Trot, my dear, but myself, had a certain property. It don't matter how much. Enough to live on. More, for she had saved a little and added to it. Betsy funded her property for some time, and then, by the advice of her man of business, laid it out on landed security. That did very well, and returned very good interest.' Still, Betsy was paid off. I'm talking of Betsy as if she was a man of war. Well, then, Betsy had to look about her for a new investment. 
She thought she was wiser now than her man of business, who was not such a good man of business by this time as it used to be. I am alluding to your father, Agnes. And she took it into her head to lay it out for herself. So she took her pigs, said my aunt, to a foreign market, and a very bad market it turned out to be. First she lost in the mining way, and then she lost in the diving way, fishing up treasure or some such Tom Tiddler nonsense, explained my aunt, rubbing her nose. And then she lost in the mining way again, and last of all, to set the thing entirely to rights, she lost in the banking way. I don't know what the bank shares were worth for a little while, said my aunt. Cent per cent was the lowest of it, I believe, but the bank was at the other end of the world, and tumbled into space, for what I know. Anyhow, it fell to pieces, and never will and never can pay sixpence, and Betsy's sixpences were all there, and there's an end of them. Least said, soonest mended. My aunt concluded this philosophical summary by fixing her eyes with a kind of triumph on Agnes, whose colour was gradually returning. "'Dear Miss Trotwood, is that all the history?' said Agnes. "'I hope it's enough, child,' said my aunt. "'If there had been more money to lose, it wouldn't have been all, I dare say. Betsy would have contrived to throw that after the rest, and make another chapter, I have little doubt. But there was no more money, and there's no more story.' Agnes had listened at first with suspended breath. Her colour still came and went, but she breathed more freely. I thought I knew why. I thought she had some fear that her unhappy father might be in some way to blame for what had happened. My aunt took her hand in hers and laughed. "'Is that all?' repeated my aunt. "'Why, yes, that's all, except—and she lived happy ever afterwards.' Perhaps I may add that of Betsy yet, one of these days. Now, Agnes, you have a wise head. So have you, Trot, in some things, though I can't compliment you always. And here my aunt shook her own at me with an energy peculiar to herself. What's to be done? Here's the cottage. Taking one time with another will produce, say, seventy pounds a year. I think we may safely put it down at that. Well, that's all we've got said my aunt, with whom it was an idiosyncrasy, as it is with some horses, to stop very short when she appeared to be in a fair way of going on for a long while. Then, said my aunt, after a rest, there's Dick. He's good for a hundred a year, but of course that must be expended on himself. I would sooner send him away, though I know I am the only person who appreciates him, than have him, and not spend his money on himself. How could Trot and I do best upon our means? What do you say, Agnes?" "'I say, Aunt,' I interposed, "'that I must do something.' "'Go for a soldier, do you mean?' returned my aunt, alarmed. "'Or go to sea? I won't hear of it. You are to be a proctor. We're not going to have any knockings on the head in this family, if you please, sir.' I was about to explain that I was not desirous of introducing that mode of provision into the family, when— Agnes inquired if my rooms were held for any long term. "'You come to the point, my dear,' said my aunt. "'They are not to be got rid of for six months at least, unless they could be underlet, and that I don't believe. The last man died here. Five people out of six would die, of course, of that woman in Nankeen with the flannel petticoat. I have little ready money, and I agree with you. The best thing we can do is to live the term out here.' and get Dick a bedroom hard by. I thought it my duty to hint at the discomfort my aunt would sustain from living in a continual state of guerrilla warfare with Mrs. Crupp, but she disposed of that objection summarily by declaring that, on the first demonstration of hostilities, she was prepared to astonish Mrs. Crupp for the whole remainder of her natural life. "'I have been thinking, Trotwood,' said Agnes diffidently, "'that if you had time—' I have a good deal of time, Agnes. I am always disengaged after four or five o'clock. And I have time early in the morning, in one way and another, said I, conscious of reddening a little as I thought of the hours and hours I had devoted to fagging about town and to and fro upon the Norwood Road. I have abundance of time. 
"'I know you would not mind,' said Agnes, coming to me and speaking in a low voice, so full of sweet and hopeful consideration that I hear it now, "'the duties of a secretary. "'Mind, my dear Agnes. "'Because,' continued Agnes, "'Dr. Strong has acted on his intention of retiring, "'and has come to live in London, "'and he asked Papa, I know, if he could recommend him one. "'Don't you think he would rather have his favourite old pupil near him "'than anybody else?' "'Dear Agnes,' said I, "'what should I do without you? "'You are always my good angel. "'I told you so. "'I never think of you in any other light.' "'Agnes answered with her pleasant laugh "'that one good angel, meaning Dora, was enough, "'and went on to remind me "'that the doctor had been used to occupy himself in his study "'early in the morning and in the evening, "'and that probably my leisure would suit his requirements very well.' I was scarcely more delighted with the prospect of earning my own bread than with the hope of earning it under my old master. In short, acting on the advice of Agnes, I sat down and wrote a letter to the doctor, stating my object, and appointing to call on him next day at ten in the forenoon. This I addressed to Highgate, for in that place so memorable to me he lived, and went out and posted myself without losing a minute. Wherever Agnes was, some agreeable token of her noiseless presence seemed inseparable from the place. When I came back, I found my aunt's birds hanging, just as they had hung so long in the parlour window of the cottage, and my easy-chair imitating my aunt's much easier chair in its position at the open window, and even the round green fan which my aunt had brought away with her, screwed on to the window-sill. I knew who had done all this, by its seeming to have quietly done itself, and I should have known in a moment who had arranged my neglected books in the old order of my school days, even if I had supposed Agnes to be miles away instead of seeing her busy with them and smiling at the disorder into which they had fallen. My aunt was quite gracious on the subject of the Thames. It really did look very well with the sun upon it, though not like the sea before the cottage but she could not relent towards the London smoke, which she said, peppered everything. A complete revolution in which Peggotty bore a prominent part was being effected in every corner of my rooms in regard of this pepper. And I was looking on, thinking how little even Peggotty seemed to do with a good deal of bustle and how much Agnes did without any bustle at all, when a knock came at the door. I think, said Agnes, turning pale, "'It's Papa. He promised me that he would come.' I opened the door and admitted not only Mr. Wickfield, but Uriah Heep. I had not seen Mr. Wickfield for some time. I was prepared for a great change in him, after what I had heard from Agnes, but his appearance shocked me. It was not that he looked many years older, though still dressed with the old scrupulous cleanliness, or that there was an unwholesome ruddiness upon his face, or that his eyes were full and bloodshot, or that there was a nervous trembling in his hand, the cause of which I knew, and had for some years seen at work. It was not that he had lost his good looks or his old bearing of a gentleman, for that he had not, but the thing that struck me most was that with the evidence of his native superiority still upon him, he should submit himself to that crawling impersonation of meanness, Uriah Heep. The reversal of the two natures in their relative positions, Uriah's of power and Mr. Wickfield's of dependence, was a sight more painful to me than I can express. If I had seen an ape taking command of a man, I should hardly have thought it a more degrading spectacle." He appeared to be only too conscious of it himself. When he came in, he stood still, and with his head bowed, as if he felt it. This was only for a moment, for Agnes softly said to him, "'Papa, here is Miss Trotwood, and Trotwood, whom you have not seen for a long while.' And then he approached, and constrainedly gave my aunt his hand, and shook hands more cordially with me. In the moment's pause I speak of, I saw Uriah's countenance form itself into a most ill-favoured smile. Agnes saw it too, I think, for she shrank from him. 
What my aunt saw, or did not see, I defy the science of physiognomy to have made out without her own consent. I believe there never was anybody with such an imperturbable countenance when she chose. Her face might have been a dead wall on the occasion in question for any light it threw upon her thoughts, until she broke silence with her usual abruptness. "'Well, Wickfield,' said my aunt, and he looked up at her for the first time. "'I have been telling your daughter how well I have been disposing of my money for myself, because I couldn't trust it to you, as you were growing rusty in business matters. We have been taking counsel together, and getting on very well, all things considered. Agnes is worth the whole firm, in my opinion.' "'If I may humbly make the remark,' said Uriah Heep, with a writhe, I fully agree with Miss Betsy Trotwood, and should be really too happy if Miss Agnes was a partner. "'You're a partner yourself, you know,' returned my aunt. "'And that's about enough for you, I expect. How do you find yourself, sir?' In acknowledgment of this question, addressed to him with extraordinary curtness, Mr. Heap, uncomfortably clutching the blue bag he carried, replied that he was pretty well. He thanked my aunt, and hoped she was the same. "'And you, master, I should say, Miss Copperfield,' pursued Uriah, "'I hope I see you well. I am rejoiced to see you, Mr. Copperfield, even under present circumstances.' I believed that, for he seemed to relish them very much. "'Present circumstances is not what your friends would wish for you, Mr. Copperfield, but it isn't money makes the man. It's—' "'I am really unequal with my humble powers to express what it is,' said Uriah, with a fawning jerk. "'But it isn't money.' Here he shook hands with me, not in the common way, but standing at a good distance from me, and lifting my hand up and down like a pump-handle that he was a little afraid of. "'And how do you think we are looking, Master Copperfield? I should say, Mister,' fawned Uriah. "'Don't you find Mr. Wickfield blooming, sir? Years don't tell much in our firm, Master Copperfield, except in raising up the humble, namely mother and self, and in developing,' he added as an afterthought, "'the beautiful, namely Miss Agnes.' He jerked himself about after this compliment in such an intolerable manner that my aunt, who had sat looking straight at him, lost all patience. "'Deuce take the man!' said my aunt sternly. "'What's he about? Don't be galvanic, sir!' "'I ask your pardon, Miss Trotwood,' returned Uriah. "'I'm aware you're nervous.' "'Go along with you, sir,' said my aunt, anything but appeased. "'Don't presume to say so. I am nothing of the sort. "'If you're an eel, sir, conduct yourself like one. "'If you're a man, control your limbs, sir. Good God!' said my aunt, with great indignation. "'I am not going to be serpentined and corkscrewed out of my senses.' Mr. Heap was rather abashed, as most people might have been, by this explosion which derived great additional force from the indignant manner in which my aunt afterwards moved in her chair, and shook her head as if she were making snaps or bounces at him. But he said to me aside in a meek voice, I am well aware, Master Copperfield, that Miss Trotwood, though an excellent lady, has a quick temper. Indeed, I think I had the pleasure of knowing her when I was an humble clerk, before you did, Master Copperfield, and it's only natural, I am sure, that it should be made quicker by present circumstances. The wonder is that it isn't much worse. I only call to say that if there was anything we could do in present circumstances, mother or self, or Wickfield and Heap, we should be really glad I may go so far," said Uriah, with a sickly smile at his partner. "'Uriah Heap,' said Mr. Wickfield, in a monotonous, forced way, "'is active in the business, Trotwood. What he says I quite concur in. You know I had an old interest in you, apart from that. What Uriah says I quite concur in.' "'Oh, what a reward it is!' said Uriah, drawing up one leg at the risk of bringing down upon himself another visitation from my aunt, to be so trusted in. But I hope I am able to do something to relieve him from the fatigues of business, Master Copperfield.' "'Uriah Heap is a great relief to me,' said Mr. Wickfield, in the same dull voice. 
It's a load off my mind, Trotwood, to have such a partner. The Red Fox made him say all this, I knew, to exhibit him to me in the light he had indicated on the night when he poisoned my rest. I saw the same ill-favoured smile upon his face again, and saw how he watched me. "'You are not going, Papa,' said Agnes anxiously. "'Will you not walk back with Trotwood and me?' He would have looked to Uriah, I believe, before replying, if that worthy had not anticipated him. "'I am bespoke myself,' said Uriah, "'on business, otherwise I should have been happy to have kept with my friends. But I leave my partner to represent the firm. Miss Agnes, ever yours. I wish you good day, Master Copperfield, and leave my humble respects for Miss Betsy Trotwood.' With those words he retired, kissing his great hand and leering at us like a mask. We sat there, talking about our pleasant old Canterbury days an hour or two. Mr. Wickfield, left to Agnes, soon became more like his former self, though there was a settled depression upon him which he never shook off. For all that he brightened, and had an evident pleasure in hearing us recall the little incidents of our old life, many of which he remembered very well. He said it was like those times to be alone with Agnes and me again, and he wished to heaven they had never changed. I am sure there was an influence in the placid face of Agnes, and in the very touch of her hand upon his arm, that did wonders for him. My aunt, who was busy nearly all this while with Peggotty in the inner room, would not accompany us to the place where they were staying, but insisted on my going, and I went. We dined together. After dinner Agnes sat beside him as of old, and poured out his wine. He took what she gave him, and no more, like a child, and we all three sat together at a window as the evening gathered in. When it was almost dark he lay down on a sofa, Agnes pillowing his head and bending over him a little while, and when she came back to the window it was not so dark but I could see tears glittering in her eyes. I pray heaven that I never may forget the dear girl in her love and truth at that time of my life, for if I should, I must be drawing near the end, and then I would desire to remember her best. She filled my heart with such good resolutions, strengthened my weakness so by her example, so directed, I know not how, she was too modest and gentle to advise me in many words, the wandering ardour and unsettled purpose within me, that all the little good I have done, and all the harm I have forborne, I solemnly believe I may refer to her. And how she spoke to me of Dora, sitting at the window in the dark, listened to my praises of her, praised again, and round the little fairy figure shed some glimpses of her own pure light that made it yet more precious and more innocent to me. O oh, Agnes, sister of my boyhood, if I had known then what I knew long afterwards. There was a beggar in the street when I went down, and as I turned my head towards the window, thinking of her calm, seraphic eyes, he made me start by muttering, as if he were an echo of the morning, blind, blind, blind. Chapter 36 Enthusiasm I began the next day with another dive into the Roman bath, and then started for Highgate. I was not dispirited now, I was not afraid of the shabby coat, and had no yearnings after gallant greys. My whole manner of thinking of our late misfortune was changed. What I had to do was to show my aunt that her past goodness to me had not been thrown away on an insensible, ungrateful object. What I had to do was to turn the painful discipline of my younger days to account by going to work with a resolute and steady heart. What I had to do was to take my woodman's axe in my hand and clear my own way through the forest of difficulty by cutting down the trees until I came to Dora. And I went on at a mighty rate, as if it could be done by walking. When I found myself on the familiar Highgate Road, pursuing such a different errand from that old one of pleasure with which it was associated, it seemed as if a complete change had come on my whole life. But that did not discourage me. With the new life came new purpose, new intention. Great was the labour 
priceless the reward. Dora was the reward, and Dora must be won. I got into such a transport that I felt quite sorry my coat was not a little shabby already. I wanted to be cutting at those trees in the forest of difficulty under circumstances that should prove my strength. I had a good mind to ask an old man in wire spectacles, who was breaking stones upon the road, to lend me his hammer for a little while, and let me begin to beat a path to Dora out of granite. I stimulated myself into such a heat, and got so out of breath, that I felt as if I had been earning I don't know how much. In this state I went into a cottage that I saw was to let, and examined it narrowly, for I felt it necessary to be practical. It would do for me and Dora admirably, with a little front garden for Jip to run about in and bark at the tradespeople through the railings, and a capital room upstairs for my aunt. I came out again, hotter and faster than ever, and dashed up to Highgate at such a rate as I was there an hour too early, and though I had not been, should have been obliged to stroll about to cool myself before I was at all presentable. My first care after putting myself under this necessary course of preparation, was to find the doctor's house. It was not in that part of Highgate where Mrs. Steerforth lived, but quite on the opposite side of the little town. When I had made this discovery, I went back, in an attraction I could not resist, to a lane by Mrs. Steerforth's, and looked over the corner of the garden wall. His room was shut up close. The conservatory doors were standing open, and Rosa Dartle was walking bareheaded with a quick, impetuous step up and down a gravel walk on one side of the lawn. She gave me the idea of some fierce thing that was dragging the length of its chain to and fro upon a beaten track and wearing its heart out. I came softly away from my place of observation, and avoiding that part of the neighbourhood and wishing I had not gone near it, strolled about until it was ten o'clock. The church with the slender spire that stands on the top of the hill now was not there then to tell me the time. An old red brick mansion used as a school was in its place, and a fine old house it must have been to go to school at, as I recollect it. When I approached the doctor's cottage, a pretty old place on which he seemed to have expended some money, if I might judge from the embellishments and repairs that had the look of being just completed, I saw him walking in the garden at the side, gaiters and all, as if he had never left off walking since the days of my pupilage. He had his old companions about him too, for there were plenty of high trees in the neighbourhood, and two or three rooks were on the grass, looking after him, as if they had been written to about him by the Canterbury rooks, and were observing him closely in consequence. Knowing the utter hopelessness of attracting his attention from that distance, I made bold to open the gate and walk after him so as to meet him when he should turn around. When he did, and came towards me, he looked at me thoughtfully for a few moments, evidently without thinking about me at all, and then his benevolent face expressed extraordinary pleasure, and he took me by both hands. "'Why, my dear Copperfield,' said the doctor, "'you are a man!' "'How do you do? I am delighted to see you. My dear Copperfield, how very much you have improved. You are quite—yes, dear me. I hoped he was well, and Mrs. Strong too. "'Oh, dear, yes,' said the doctor. "'Annie's quite well, and she'll be delighted to see you. You were always her favourite. She said so last night when I showed her your letter, and, yes, to be sure, you recollect Mr. Jack Malden, Copperfield?' "'Perfectly, sir.' "'Of course,' said the doctor. "'To be sure he's pretty well, too.' "'Has he come home, sir?' I inquired. "'From India?' said the doctor. "'Yes. Mr. Jack Malden couldn't bear the climate, my dear. Mrs. Markleham, you've not forgotten Mrs. Markleham?' "'Forgotten the old soldier, and in that short time—' "'Mrs. Markleham,' said the doctor, "'was quite vexed about him, poor thing. So we've got him at home again, and we have brought him a little patent place which agrees with him much better. I knew enough of Mr. Jack Malden to suspect from this account that it was a place where there was not much to do, and which was pretty well paid. The doctor, 
walking up and down with his hand on my shoulder and his kind face turned encouragingly to mine, went on, "'Now, my dear Copperfield, in reference to this proposal of yours, it's very gratifying and agreeable to me, I'm sure, but don't you think you could do better? You achieved distinction, you know, when you were with us. You are qualified for many good things. You have laid a foundation that any edifice may be raised upon, and is it not a pity that you should devote the springtime of your life to such a poor pursuit as I can offer? I became very glowing again, and expressing myself in a rhapsodical style, I am afraid, urged my request strongly, reminding the doctor that I had already a profession. "'Very well,' returned the doctor. "'That's true.' "'Certainly. Your having a profession and being actually engaged in studying it makes a difference. But, my good young friend, what seventy pounds a year?' "'It doubles our income, Dr. Strong,' said I. "'Dear me,' replied the doctor, "'to think of that. Not that I mean to say it's rigidly limited to seventy pounds a year, because I have always contemplated making any young friend I might thus employ a present, too.' "'Undoubtedly,' said the doctor, still walking me up and down with his hand on my shoulder. "'I have always taken an annual present into account.' "'My dear tutor,' said I, now really without any nonsense, "'to whom I owe more obligations already that I can ever acknowledge.' "'No, no,' interposed the doctor. "'Pardon me. "'If you will take such time as I have, and that is my mornings and evenings,' and can think it worth seventy pounds a year, you will do me such a service as I cannot express. "'Dear me,' said the doctor innocently, "'to think that so little should go for so much. Dear, dear! And when you can do better, you will. On your word now,' said the doctor, which he had always made a very grave appeal to the honour of us boys. "'On my word, sir,' I returned, answering in our old school manner. "'Then be it so,' said the doctor, clapping me on the shoulder, and still keeping his hand there as we still walked up and down. "'And I shall be twenty times happier, sir,' said I, with a little, I hope innocent, flattery, "'if my employment is to be on the dictionary.' The doctor stopped, smilingly clapped me on the shoulder again, and exclaimed with a triumph most delightful to behold— as if I had penetrated to the profoundest depths of mortal sagacity. "'My dear young friend, you have hit it. It is the dictionary.' How could it be anything else? His pockets were as full of it as his head. It was sticking out of him in all directions. He told me that since his retirement from scholastic life he had been advancing with it wonderfully, and that nothing could suit him better than the proposed arrangements for morning and evening work as it was his custom, to walk about in the daytime with his considering cap on. His papers were in a little confusion, in consequence of Mr. Jack Malden, having lately proffered his occasional services as an amanuensis, and not being accustomed to that occupation. But we should soon put right what was amiss, and go on swimmingly. Afterwards, when we were fairly at our work, I found Mr. Jack Maldon's efforts more troublesome to me than I had expected, as he had not confined himself to making numerous mistakes, but had sketched so many soldiers' and ladies' heads over the doctor's manuscript that I often became involved in labyrinths of obscurity. The doctor was quite happy in the prospect of our going to work together on that wonderful performance, and we settled to begin next morning at seven o'clock. We were to work two hours every morning, and two or three hours every night, except on Saturdays, when I was to rest. On Sundays, of course, I was to rest also, and I consider these very easy terms. Our plans being thus arranged to our mutual satisfaction, the doctor took me into the house to present me to Mrs. Strong, whom we found in the doctor's new study, dusting his books. A freedom which he never permitted anybody else to take with those sacred favourites. They had postponed their breakfast on my account, and we sat down to table together. We had not been seated long, when I saw an approaching arrival in Mrs. Strong's face, before I heard any sound of it. A gentleman on horseback came to the gate, and, 
leading his horse into the little court with the bridle over his arm, as if he were quite at home, tied him to a ring in the empty coach-house wall, and came into the breakfast parlour, whip in hand. It was Mr. Jack Malden. And Mr. Jack Malden was not at all improved by India, I thought. I was in a state of ferocious virtue, however, as to young men who were not cutting down the trees in the forest of difficulty, and my impression must be received with due allowance. "'Mr. Jack,' said the doctor, "'Copperfield!' Mr. Jack Malden shook hands with me, but not very warmly, I believed, and with an air of languid patronage at which I secretly took great umbrage. But his languor altogether was quite a wonderful sight, except when he addressed himself to his cousin Annie. "'Have you breakfasted this morning, Mr. Jack?' said the doctor. "'I hardly ever take breakfast, sir,' he replied, with his head thrown back into an easy chair. "'I find it bores me.' "'Is there any news today? inquired the doctor. "'Nothing at all, sir,' replied Mr. Malden. "'There's an account about the people being hungry and discontented down in the north, "'but they're always being hungry and discontented somewhere.' "'The doctor looked grave and said, as though he wished to change the subject, "'Then there's no news at all, and no news, they say, is good news. "'There's a long statement in the papers, sir, about a murder.' observed Mr. Malden. But somebody's always being murdered, and I didn't read it. A display of indifference to all the actions and passions of mankind was not supposed to be such a distinguished quality at that time, I think, as I have observed it to be considered since. I have known it very fashionable indeed. I have seen it displayed with such success that I have encountered some fine ladies and gentlemen who might as well have been born caterpillars. Perhaps it impressed me the more then, because it was new to me, but it certainly did not tend to exalt my opinion of or to strengthen my confidence in Mr. Jack Malden. "'I came out to inquire whether Annie would like to go to the opera tonight,' said Mr. Malden, turning to her. "'It's the last good night there will be this season, and there's a singer there whom she really ought to hear. She's perfectly exquisite. Besides which, she is so charmingly ugly.' relapsing into languor. The doctor, ever pleased with what was likely to please his young wife, turned to her and said, "'You must go, Annie. You must go.' "'I would rather not,' she said to the doctor. "'I prefer to remain at home. I would much rather remain at home.' Without looking at her cousin, she then addressed me and asked me about Agnes and whether she should see her and whether she was not likely to come that day and was so much disturbed that I wondered how even the doctor buttering his toast could be blind to what was so obvious. But he saw nothing. He told her, good-naturedly, that she was young and ought to be amused and entertained, and must not allow herself to be made dull by a dull old fellow. Moreover, he said, he wanted to hear her sing all the new singer's songs to him. And how could she do that well, unless she went? So the doctor persisted in making the engagement for her, and Mr. Jack Malden was to come back to dinner. This concluded, he went to his patent place, I suppose, but at all events went away on his horse, looking very idle. I was curious to find out next morning whether she had been. She had not, but had sent into London to put her cousin off, and had gone out in the afternoon to see Agnes and had prevailed upon the doctor to go with her. And they had walked home by the fields, the doctor told me, the evening being delightful. I wondered then whether she would have gone if Agnes had not been in town, and whether Agnes had some good influence over her too. She did not look very happy, I thought, but it was a good face, or a very false one. I often glanced at it, for she sat in the window all the time we were at work, and made our breakfast which we took by snatches as we were employed. When I left at nine o'clock, she was kneeling on the ground at the doctor's feet, putting on his shoes and gaiters for him. There was a softened shade upon her face, thrown from some green leaves overhanging the open window of the low room, and I thought all the way to Doctor's Commons of the night when I had seen it looking at him as he read. I was pretty busy now, up at five in the morning and home at nine or ten at night, but I had infinite satisfaction in being so closely engaged, 
and never walked slowly on any account, and felt enthusiastically that the more I tired myself, the more I was doing to deserve Dora. I had not revealed myself in my altered character to Dora yet, because she was coming to see Miss Mills in a few days, and I deferred all I had to tell her until then, merely informing her in my letters all our communications were secretly forwarded through Miss Mills, that I had much to tell her. In the meantime, I put myself on a short allowance of bear's grease, wholly abandoned scented soap and lavender water, and sold off three waistcoats at a prodigious sacrifice at being too luxurious for my stern career. Not satisfied with all these proceedings, but burning with impatience to do something more, I went to see Traddles, now lodging up behind the parapet of a house in Castle Street, Holborn. Mr. Dick, who had been with me to Highgate twice already, and had resumed his companionship with the doctor, I took with me. I took Mr. Dick with me because, acutely sensitive to my aunt's reverses, and sincerely believing that no galley-slave or convict worked as I did, he had begun to fret and worry himself out of spirits and appetites as having nothing useful to do. In this condition, he felt more incapable of finishing the memorial than ever, and the harder he worked at it, the oftener that unlucky head of King Charles I got into it. Seriously apprehending that his malady would increase unless we put some innocent deception upon him, and caused him to believe that he was useful, or unless we could put him into the way of being really useful, which would be better, I made up my mind to try if Traddles could help us. Before we went I wrote Traddles a full statement of all that had happened, and Traddles wrote me back a capital answer, expressive of his sympathies and friendship. We found him hard at work with his inkstand and papers, refreshed by the sight of the flowerpot stand and the little round table in a corner of the small apartment. He received us cordially, and made friends with Mr. Dick in a moment. Mr. Dick professed an absolute certainty of having seen him before, and we both said, very likely. The first subject on which I had to consult Traddles was this. I had heard that many men distinguished in various pursuits had begun life by reporting the debates in Parliament. Traddles, having mentioned newspapers to me as one of his hopes, I had put the two things together, and told Traddles in my letter that I wished to know how I could qualify myself for this pursuit. Traddles now informed me, as the result of his inquiries, that the mere mechanical acquisition necessary, except in rare cases, for thorough excellence in it, that is to say a perfect and entire command of the mystery of shorthand writing and reading, was about equal in difficulty to the mastery of six languages, and that it might perhaps be attained by dint of perseverance in the course of a few years. Traddles reasonably supposed that this would settle the business, but I, only feeling that there indeed were a few tall trees to be hewn down, immediately resolved to work my way on to Dora through this thicket, axe in hand. "'I am very much obliged to you, my dear Traddles,' said I. "'I'll begin to-morrow.' Traddles looked astonished, as he well might, but he had no notion as yet of my rapturous condition. "'I'll buy a book,' said I, "'with a good scheme of this art in it.' I'll work at it at the Commons, where I haven't half enough to do. I'll take down the speeches in our court for practice. Traddles, my dear fellow, I'll master it." "'Dear me!' said Traddles, opening his eyes. "'I had no idea you were such a determined character, Copperfield.' I don't know how he should have had, for it was new enough to me. I passed that off, and brought Mr. Dick on the carpet. "'You see,' said Mr. Dick wistfully, if I could exert myself, Mr. Traddles, if I could beat a drum or blow anything. Poor fellow! I have little doubt he would have preferred such an employment in his heart to all others. Traddles, who would not have smiled for the world, replied composedly, But you are a very good penman, sir. You told me so, Copperfield. Excellent, said I. And indeed he was. He wrote with extraordinary neatness. "'Don't you think,' said Traddles, "'you could copy writing, sir, if I got them for you?' Mr. Dick looked doubtfully at me. "'Eh, Trotwood?' I shook my head. Mr. Dick shook his and sighed. "'Tell him about the memorial,' said Mr. Dick. 
I explained to Traddles that there was a difficulty in keeping King Charles I out of Mr. Dick's manuscripts. Mr. Dick, in the meanwhile, looking very deferentially and seriously at Traddles, and sucking his thumb. "'But these writings, you know, that I speak of, are already drawn up and finished,' said Traddles, after a little consideration. "'Mr. Dick has nothing to do with them. Wouldn't that make a difference, Copperfield? At all events, wouldn't it be well to try?' This gave us new hope. Traddles and I, laying our heads together apart, while Mr. Dick anxiously watched us from his chair, we concocted a scheme in virtue of which we got him to work next day with triumphant success. On a table by the window in Buckingham Street, we set out the work Traddles procured for him, which was to make, I forget how many, copies of a legal document about some right of way, and on another table we spread the last unfinished original of the great memorial. Our instructions to Mr. Dick were that he should copy exactly what he had before him, without the least departure from the original, and that when he felt it necessary to make the slightest allusion to King Charles I, he should fly to the memorial. We exhorted him to be resolute in this, and left my aunt to observe him. My aunt reported to us afterwards that at first he was like a man playing the kettle drums, and constantly divided his attention between the two, but that, finding this confuse and fatigue him, and having his copy there, plainly before his eyes, he soon sat at it in an orderly, business-like manner, and postponed the memorial to a more convenient time. In a word, although we took great care that he should have no more to do than was good for him, and although he did not begin with the beginning of the week, he earned by the following Saturday night ten shillings and ninepence, and never, while I live, shall I forget his going about to all the shops in the neighbourhood to change this treasure into sixpences, or his bringing them to my aunt arranged in the form of a heart upon a waiter, with tears of joy and pride in his eyes. He was like one under the propitious influence of a charm from the moment of his being usefully employed, and if there were a happy man in the world that Saturday night, it was the grateful creature who thought my aunt the most wonderful woman in existence, and me the most wonderful young man. "'No starving now, Trotwood,' said Mr. Dick, shaking hands with me in a corner. "'I'll provide for her, sir,' and he flourished his ten fingers in the air as if they were ten banks. I hardly know which was the better pleased, Traddles or I. "'It really,' said Traddles suddenly, taking a letter out of his pocket and giving it to me, "'put Mr. Micawber quite out of my head.' The letter— Mr. Micawber never missed any possible opportunity of writing a letter, was addressed to me. By the kindness of T. Traddles, Esquire of the Inner Temple. It ran thus. My dear Copperfield, you may possibly not be unprepared to receive the intimation that something has turned up. I may have mentioned to you on a former occasion that I was in expectation of such an event. I am about to establish myself in one of the provincial towns of our favoured island, where the society may be described as a happy admixture of the agricultural and the clerical, in immediate connection with one of the learned professions. Mrs. Micawber and our offspring will accompany me. Our ashes, at a future period, will probably be found commingled in the cemetery attached to a venerable pile for which the spot to which I refer has acquired a reputation, shall I say, from China to Peru. In bidding adieu to the modern Babylon, where we have undergone many vicissitudes, I trust not ignobly Mrs. Micawber and myself cannot disguise from our minds that we part, it may be for years and it may be for ever, with an individual linked by strong associations to the altar of our domestic life. If on the eve of such a departure you will accompany our mutual friend, Mr. Thomas Traddles, to our present abode, and there reciprocate the wishes natural to the occasion, you will confer a boon. One, one who is ever yours, Wilkins Micawber. I was glad to find that Mr. Micawber had got rid of his dust and ashes, and that something really had turned up at last. Learning from Traddles that the invitation referred to the evening then wearing away, I expressed my readiness to do honour to it, and we went off together to the lodging which Mr. Micawber occupied as Mr. Mortimer, and which was situated near the top of the Gray's Inn Road. 
The resources of this lodging were so limited that we found the twins, now some eight or nine years old, reposing in a turned-up bedspread in the family sitting-room where Mr. Micawber had pre-prepared, in a wash-hand-stand jug, what he called a brew of the agreeable beverage for which he was famous. I had the pleasure on this occasion of renewing the acquaintance of Master Micawber, whom I found a promising boy of about twelve or thirteen, very subject to that restlessness of limb which is not an unfrequent phenomenon in use of his age. I also became once more known to his sister, Miss Micawber, in whom, as Mr. Micawber told us, her mother renewed her youth like the phoenix. "'My dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, "'yourself and Mr. Traddles find us on the brink of migration, and will excuse any little discomforts incidental to that position.' Glancing round as I made a suitable reply, I observed that the family effects were already packed, and that the amount of luggage was by no means overwhelming. I congratulated Mrs. Micawber on the approaching change. "'My dear Mr. Copperfield,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'of your friendly interest in all our affairs, I am well assured. My family may consider it banishment, if they please, but I am a wife and a mother, and I never will desert Mr. Micawber.' Traddles, appealed to by Mrs. Micawber's eye, feelingly acquiesced. "'That,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'that at least is my view, my dear Mr. Copperfield and Mr. Traddles, of the obligation which I took upon myself when I repeated the irrevocable words, I, Emma, take thee Wilkins. I read the service over with a flat candle on the previous night, and the conclusion I derived from it was that I never could desert Mr. Micawber, and,' said Mrs. Micawber, though it is possible I may be mistaken in my view of the ceremony, I never will. "'My dear,' said Mr. Micawber, a little impatiently, "'I am not conscious that you are expected to do anything of the sort.' "'I am aware, my dear Mr. Copperfield,' pursued Mrs. Micawber, "'that I am now about to cast my lot among strangers, and I am also aware that the various members of my family, to whom Mr. Micawber has written in the most gentlemanly terms, announcing that fact, have not taken the least notice of Mr. Micawber's communication. Indeed, I may be superstitious, said Mrs. Micawber, but it appears to me that Mr. Micawber is destined never to receive any answers whatever to the great majority of the communications he writes. I may augur from the silence of my family that they object to the resolution I have taken." "'But I should not allow myself to be swerved from the path of duty, Mr. Copperfield, "'even by my papa and mamma, were they still living.' "'I expressed my opinion that this was going in the right direction. "'It may be a sacrifice,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'to immure oneself in a cathedral town. "'But surely, Mr. Copperfield, if it is a sacrifice in me, "'it is much more a sacrifice in a man of Mr. Micawber's abilities.' "'Oh!' "'You're going to a cathedral town?' said I. Mr. Micawber, who had been helping us all out of the wash-hand stand jug, replied, "'To Canterbury, in fact, my dear Copperfield. I have entered into arrangements, by virtue of which I stand pledged and contracted to our friend Heap, to assist and serve him in the capacity of, and to be, his confidential clerk.' I stared at Mr. Micawber, who greatly enjoyed my surprise. "'I am bound to state to you,' he said, with an official air, "'that the business habits and the prudent suggestions of Mrs. Micawber "'have in a great measure conduced to this result. "'The gauntlet, to which Mrs. Micawber referred upon a former occasion, "'being thrown down in the form of an advertisement, "'was taken up by my friend Heap, and led to a mutual recognition. "'Of my friend Heap,' said Mr. Micawber, "'who is a man of remarkable shrewdness,' I desire to speak with all possible respect. My friend Heap has not fixed the positive remuneration at too high a figure, but he has made a great deal in the way of extrication from the pressure of pecuniary difficulties, contingent on the value of my service, and on the value of those services I pin my faith. Such address and intelligence as I chance to possess, said Mr. Micawber, boastfully disparaging himself with the old genteel air, will be devoted to my friend Heap's service. I have already some acquaintance with the law as a defendant on civil process, 
and I shall immediately apply myself to the commentaries of one of the most eminent and remarkable of our English jurists. I believe it is unnecessary to add that I allude to Mr. Justice Blackstone. These observations, and indeed the greater part of the observations made that evening, were interrupted by Mrs. Micawber's discovering that Master Micawber was sitting on his boots, or holding his head on with both arms, as if he felt it loose or accidentally kicking treadles under the table, or shuffling his feet over one another, or producing them at distances from himself apparently outrageous to nature, or lying sideways with his hair among the wine-glasses, or developing his restlessness of limb in some other form incompatible with the general interests of society, and by Master Micawber's receiving those discoveries in a resentful spirit. I sat all the while amazed by Mr. Micawber's disclosure, and wondering what it meant until Mrs. Micawber resumed the thread of the discourse, and claimed my attention. "'What I particularly request Mr. Micawber to be careful of is,' said Mr. Micawber, "'that he does not, my dear Mr. Copperfield, in applying himself to this subordinate branch of the law, place it out of his power to rise, ultimately, to the top of the tree. I am convinced that Mr. Micawber, giving his mind to a profession so adapted to his fertile resources, and his flow of language, must distinguish himself. "'Now, for example, Mr. Traddles,' said Mrs. Micawber, assuming a profound air, "'a judge, or even, say, a chancellor. Does an individual place himself beyond the pale of those preferments by entering on such an office as Mr. Micawber has accepted?' "'My dear,' observed Mr. Micawber, but glancing inquisitively at Traddles, too, "'we have time enough before us for the consideration of those questions.' Micawber, she returned. No, your mistake in life is that you do not look forward far enough. You are bound in justice to your family, if not to yourself, to take in at a comprehensive glance the extremest point in the horizon to which your abilities may lead you. Mr. Micawber coughed and drank his punch with an air of exceeding satisfaction, still glancing at Traddles as if he desired to have his opinion. Why, the plain state of the case, Mrs. Micawber, said Traddles, mildly breaking the truth to her. I mean, the real prosaic fact, you know. Just so, said Mrs. Micawber. My dear Mr. Traddles, I wish to be as prosaic and literal as possible on a subject of so much importance. Is, said Traddles, that this branch of the law, even if Mr. Micawber were a regular solicitor— Exactly so, returned Mrs. Micawber. "'Wilkins, you're squinting, and will not be able to get your eyes back.' "'Has nothing,' pursued Traddles, "'to do with that. Only a barrister is eligible for such preferments, and Mr. Micawber could not be a barrister without being entered at an inn of court as a student for five years.' "'Do I follow you?' said Mrs. Micawber, with her most affable air of business. "'Do I understand, my dear Mr. Traddles, that at the expiration of that period Mr. Micawber would be eligible as a judge or chancellor? He would be eligible, returned Traddles, with a strong emphasis on that word. Thank you, said Mrs. Micawber. That is quite sufficient. If such is the case, and Mr. Micawber forfeits no privilege by entering on these duties, my anxiety is set at rest. I speak, said Mrs. Micawber, as a female, necessarily, but I have always been of opinion that Mr. Micawber possesses what I have heard my papa call, when I lived at home, the judicial mind, and I hope Mr. Micawber is now entering on a field where that mind will develop itself and take a commanding station. I quite believe that Mr. Micawber saw himself, in his judicial mind's eyes, on the woolsack. He passed his hand complacently over his bald head, and said with ostentatious resignation, "'My dear, we will not anticipate the decrees of fortune. If I am reserved to wear a wig, I am at least prepared externally, in allusion to his baldness. For that distinction I do not, said Mr. Micawber, regret my hair, and I may have been deprived of it for a specific purpose. I cannot say. It is my intention, my dear Copperfield, to educate my son for the church. I will not deny that I should be happy on his account to attain to eminence.' "'For the church,' 
said I, still pondering between wiles on Uriah Heep. Yes, said Mr. Micawber. He has a remarkable head voice, and will commence as a chorister. Our residence at Canterbury and our local connection will no doubt enable him to take advantage of any vacancy that may arise in the cathedral corps. On looking at Master Micawber again, I saw that he had a certain expression of face as if his voice were behind his eyebrows, where it presently appeared to be on his singing us, as an alternative between that and bed, the woodpecker tapping. After many compliments on his performance, we fell into some general conversation, and as I was too full of my desperate intentions to keep my altered circumstances to myself, I made them known to Mr. and Mrs. Micawber. I cannot express how extremely delighted they both were by the idea of my aunt's being in difficulties, and how comfortable and friendly it made them. When we were nearly come to the last round of the punch, I addressed myself to Traddles, and reminded him that we must not separate without wishing our friends health, happiness, and success in their new career. I begged Mr. Micawber to fill us bumpers, and proposed the toast in due form, shaking hands with him across the table, and kissing Mrs. Micawber, to commemorate that eventful occasion. Traddles imitated me in the first particular, but did not consider himself a sufficiently old friend to venture on the second. "'My dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, rising with one of his thumbs in each of his waistcoat pockets, "'the companion of my youth, if I may be allowed the expression, and my esteemed friend Traddles, if I may be permitted to call him so, will allow me, on the part of Mrs. Micawber, myself, and our offspring, to thank them in the warmest and most uncompromising terms for their good wishes. It may be expected that on the eve of a migration which will consign us to a perfectly new existence, Mr. Micawber spoke, as if they were going for five hundred thousand miles, I should offer a few valedictory remarks to two such friends as I see before me. But all that I have to say in this way I have said. Whatever station in society I may attain, through the medium of the learned profession of which I am about to become an unworthy member, I shall endeavour not to disgrace, and Mrs. Micawber will be safe to adorn. Under the temporary pressure of pecuniary liabilities, contracted with a view to their immediate liquidation, but remaining unliquidated through a combination of circumstances, I have been under the necessity of assuming a garb from which my natural instincts recoil. I allude to spectacles, and possessing myself of a cognomen to which I can establish no legitimate pretensions. All I have to say on that score is that the cloud has passed from the dreary scene, and the god of day is once more high upon the mountain tops. On Monday next, on the arrival of the four o'clock afternoon coach at Canterbury, my foot will be on my native heath, my name Micawber. Mr. Micawber resumed his seat on the close of these remarks, and drank two glasses of punch in grave succession. He then said with much solemnity, "'One thing more I have to do before this separation is complete, and that is to perform an act of justice. My friend Mr. Thomas Traddles has on two several occasions put his name, if I may use a common expression, to bills of exchange for my accommodation.' On the first occasion, Mr. Thomas Traddles was left, let me say, in short, in the lurch. The fulfilment of the second has not yet arrived. The amount of the first obligation, here Mr. Micawber carefully referred to papers, was, I believe, twenty-three, four, nine and a half. Of the second, according to my entry of that transaction, eighteen, six, two. These sums united make a total, if my calculation is correct, amounting to forty-one, ten, eleven, and a half. My friend Cofferfield will perhaps do me the favour to check that total. I did so, and found it correct. "'To leave this metropolis,' said Mr. Micawber, "'and my friend Mr. Thomas Traddles, without acquitting myself of the pecuniary part of this obligation, would weigh upon my mind to an insupportable extent.' I have therefore prepared for my friend Mr. Thomas Traddles, and I now hold in my hand a document which accomplishes the desired object. I beg to hand to my friend Mr. Thomas Traddles my I.O.U. 
for 41, 10, 11 and a half, and I am happy to recover my moral dignity and to know that I can once more walk erect before my fellow man. With this introduction, which greatly affected him, Mr. Micawber placed his I.O.U. in the hands of Traddles, and said he wished him well in every relation of life. I am persuaded, not only that this was quite the same to Mr. Micawber as paying the money, but that Traddles himself hardly knew the difference until he had had the time to think about it. Mr. Micawber walked so erect before his fellow man, on the strength of this virtuous action, that his chest looked half as broad again when he lighted us downstairs. We parted with great heartiness on both sides, and when I had seen Traddles to his own door, and was going home alone, I thought among the other odd and contradictory things I mused upon that, slippery as Mr. Micawber was, I was probably indebted to some compassionate recollection he retained of me as his boy lodger, for never having been asked by him for money. I certainly should not have had the moral courage to refuse it, and I have no doubt he knew that, to his credit be it written, quite as well as I did. <laughs>